Good morning. The first lesson is found in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. The word of the Lord. The responsive psalm reading is found in Psalm 139, beginning with verse 1. Please follow along with the screens. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the mountains, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, even if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel reading this morning is found in Matthew's gospel, chapter 5, beginning with verse 14. This is Jesus speaking. He says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on, a, on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. You may be seated. And let's pray. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we are excited that you've gathered us together to be uh, here in your house. This morning, um, we have been taught this last month that when we're here, we've got one foot in the sanctuary and one foot in heaven, and you are ready and eagerly desiring to bring heaven and earth together in our, here in this place today. And so, Jesus, Whatever you need to do to make that happen, will you just ready our hearts for that experience? Will you ready our minds for that experience? Will you just send the Holy Spirit to hover over us and to bring your light to us today as you take me out of your way? In Jesus' name, amen. Well, what a month we've had, right? Studying heaven and earth and how they intersect um, together and how we can experience heaven on earth when we do things like worship God and surrender to him, and when we um, seek his forgiveness, and when we are hearing hearers, and when we um, are in a relationship with Jesus, who is the light of the world. That's our topic today. I don't know about you, but over this last month, I've had some really interesting conversations, not just about heaven and earth uh, colliding and coming together, but heaven in general. One in particular sticks in my mind. It was a young man who had, uh, it was the day that he had suffered a significant death in, in his life, in the life of his family. And we were talking, and um, as I usually do when I'm talking to this particular person, 
the conversation gets to God and to the Bible, and I explain that we can find the answers about heaven here. And uh, he looked at the Bible, and he said, you know, I hear you say that this book is all about God, and his truth is here, and everything I need to know about heaven is here, and I read it, and I'm confused, and how do I really know that it's true? How can I really know what you say about God is true? And isn't that the question, really, when we think about heaven and earth? Isn't that what we really, that, doesn't it come down to that, can I trust God? Can I believe what is written about him, what is spoken about him, what is preached about him, what, what I know about him? Or does this world overcome us? You see, the world says something so vastly different about God than what the Bible does. The world says that God is mean and he's wrathful and he's just up there waiting for us to do something wrong so he can come and get us, so he can judge us, and so he can condemn us, and, and he can um, discipline us. And the world says, God can't love you. You're a sinner, and you do all of these bad things, and there's no way that if you, if the God of the Bible really is who you say he is, he can't love somebody like you. That's what the world says. But what does God say about himself? He says, I love you so much that I sent my son, my son, to die for you so that you could have eternal life. God says, I am for you. And if I'm for you, God says, who can be against you? God says, I love you and I come to give you hope for your hurting heart. God says, I love you, and I come to heal you. God says, I love you, and I come to give you a purpose. And God says, I love you, and I've got plans for your life. God says, I love you, and I want you to be in a relationship with me, and I want you to know my son that I sent to die for you. That's what, the God, what, that's what God says. Jesus declared himself to be many things. And one of those things was Jesus declared himself to be the light of the world. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but they will have the light of life. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you've got the light of the world living inside of you. How do we know that? Because Jesus said it. And we trust him. Well, where was Jesus when he said it? He and his disciples were in the city of Jerusalem. They had come there to be obedient to the commandment that God had given their, his forefathers, their forefathers, generations ago, that they would come in usually the October time frame, and they would all gather in Jerusalem for a seven-day festival called the Feast of Tabernacles, or sometimes it's called the Feast of Tents or the Feast of Booths. So they were in Jerusalem for this particular, um, for this particular feast. Leviticus, this is God speaking in Leviticus through Moses. He says, you must observe this festival for seven days every year. Every year. This is a permanent law for you. It must be observed at the appointed month from generation to generation. From the time of that commandment from God, that appointed festival was given until this very year, God's people have celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles and Jesus was being obedient and he had come to do that. As he and his uh, fellow, as his, he and his disciples had come, there were some very significant symbolism in that festival. You see, that festival was all about remembering. 
God called his people to give up their lives and surrender everything for seven days to come to where he told them to be and to remember that from the time he closed the Red Sea until they got to Mount Sinai, he was with them and he was taking care of them. And during those seven days, God commanded his people, he told his people that you are not to live in your houses, you are to live in tents. Why? In remembrance of the fact that their ancestors that were, had been in the Sinai Desert, they didn't have permanent dwelling places. They lived in tents. So if you go to Jerusalem, if you went to Jerusalem at the time of Jesus, many of the people would go up on the roof and they would put makeshift tents up there. And for seven days, they would live in those. If they didn't have that, then, you know, you can imagine Jesus and his disciples walked into Jerusalem and there are tents everywhere to be obedient to God. In addition to that, there were some really significant things um, that, the, that uh, went on. One went on in the temple. It was called, if I can remember right, um, mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, the ceremony of water libation. Happened every day. The priests would go down to the pool of Siloam, they would take a pitcher, they would fill it with water, and they would come back, and over the brazen altar, they would pour water into, off the altar into a basin. As they poured it, it was done in remembrance of Moses striking that rock, and the water gushing out. I quenched your thirst in the desert when you needed it. Not only that, but if you didn't want to remember what, Joseph, uh, what, uh, what Moses had done, you poured the water in here to remember that God also gives water over the crops for the coming harvest. But at the time that Jesus was there, Jerusalem and God's people were in a spiritual drought. So even though he was standing there in the Holy of Holies and he was watching the water being poured over the altar into the basin, he knew the hearts of his people. And he knew that they were not thirsting for this water. They were thirsting for living water. And Jesus stood up in that moment and he shouted over the crowd. He said, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow within them. It's me. Jesus was declaring to them, I want you to be certain. I want you to listen up and hear me. I am the one that gave water to the people in the desert. It was me. And not only that, I, gave, I quenched their thirst then. I'm quenching your thirst now. And I will quench your thirst forever because my water, if you come and, and drink of me, is forever Kind of like what he said to the woman at the well. I'm the same God that satisfied your thirst then, and I'm going to satisfy your thirst forever. There is a woman author who lives in the UK, uh, and she wrote an article in September of 2018, and she published it in a magazine, um, and she wrote all about the... Um, Feast of Tabernacles in this article. And she said that this feast was supposed to be for seven days in a row. And like I said, they were supposed to live in tents, but there were so many other significant things that were supposed to happen. She writes in her article, Jesus was telling them that the solution to their spiritual drought was found in him. For he is the true water of life. I can't even imagine how upset the religious leaders were when people in the crowd began to declare, this is the Messiah. God had awakened their spirits, and they were able to proclaim that Jesus was the Messiah, the Christ. That was the first declaration and statement of that year. The second one happened in another part important part of the ceremony. This was called the illumination of the temple. I want you to imagine this. This is a menorah candle. Every year, there were four of these candles that were 75 feet high that were erected in the court of women, which meant they were in the outer court of the temple, and they were lit 
every single night. Now, if you're wondering what 75 feet is, you're in good company. Pastor Jeff and I were trying to decide how high that would have been, and we discovered that if you look at the tallest point in our sanctuary, those menorahs were twice as high. Now, I'm afraid of heights. I can't even imagine if I had the job of climbing up the ladder and lighting them or putting them out. Think about that. No wonder every night when they lit them, it wasn't just the temple courts that was lit up, but it was the entire city of Jerusalem. There was nowhere during that week that you could go in Jerusalem and be in darkness because of the light. This light, this lighting of these menorahs was to tell the people, remember, God was with you in a cloud by day, and by fire at night, I got you through that wilderness. The eighth day. So the day after they had doused them out, after the candles had been um, snuffed, and there was no longer any light coming from them. In that morning, on the eighth day, Jesus stood up in front of the crowd, and he said this, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In other words, Jesus was saying, I am the light of God. I am the very Shekinah glory of God that was, that was uh, leading my people in the wilderness. That was me. Look no further, for I am the light that has always guided you. You can find that in Exodus 13. Jesus was saying, I'm better than these candles. Look, these candles are out. But my light is eternal. My light has been there from, from eternity to eternity. My light will never, ever go out. My light is the light you need inside of you. He's saying, I will illuminate your path forever. And I know sometimes we come here on Sundays and we see these kinds of things, and it's hard to get from here to here. But I am telling you that the original hearers when Jesus said that, their minds would have gone to Genesis 1. They would have gone immediately to the creation story, and they would have been asking themselves, is this man declaring that he's the very God who created the world? Yes. Yes, that's what he is saying. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and chaos and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Get the picture? What was the world like? Formless, void or empty, and chaos and darkness was everywhere. And into that, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, and the voice of God said, Let there be light, and there was instantly light. That was not the sun and the moon and the stars and the heavenly, the heavenly lights being lit up. No! Those happened on like, what, day four, I think? Maybe four? Read it. Go back to Genesis. Tell me which one it is next week. Those came later. This was the very light of heaven stepping down onto earth and filling. Suddenly, everything that was formless became, had a shape. Everything that was empty was suddenly and instantly filled. Everything that was dark became light. And God put darkness and sin and evil on its heels. And it fled. That's where the minds of the original hearers went. Everything changed. But that's not just the condition of the world. That is the condition of our hearts without Jesus. Without Jesus, you and I are formless. Without Jesus, you and I have this emptiness that cannot be quenched and cannot be filled. Without Jesus, you and I walk in darkness like no other darkness. 
we walk in the darkness of this world. But then, the Spirit of God hovers over that darkness, and God says, let there be light, and the light of the world comes and illuminates our hearts, and the darkness flees. Isn't that pretty cool? Pretty cool stuff. You know, Psalm 139 is one of my favorite psalms. This is what Jesus says. Jesus created our inmost being. It was Jesus who knit us together in our mother's womb. It was the hands of Jesus that took these, this, the world calls it a clump of cells. Jesus took it in his hands and he formed our bodies and he formed our lives. Our frames were never hidden from Jesus when we were made in the secret place, when he wove us together in the depths of the earth. His eyes, Jesus' eyes, saw our unformed body and all the days ordained for us were written in his book before even one of them came to be. The world says God doesn't care, that God is wrathful and he just wants to get us. But you know what? The Bible says God loves us. God formed us. God continues to form us. He shaped us. He continues to shape us. He filled us and he continues to fill us. And I know that this world often crushes us with its darkness. And even though you and I are believers, there are times when the darkness of this world seems to be overcoming us. And you and I can associate and, and really connect with the psalmist who goes on, who in a, verse 11 says, Surely the darkness will hide me and the light will become night around me. When we have things going on in our lives and chaos is in control and darkness is there, that's what it feels like. But you know what the next verse says? This is where our hope comes from. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like day, for darkness is light to you. When darkness is too much for us, it is not too much for God. The light of the world stepped into darkness and it fled. When we have darkness overcoming us, pray, cry out to God, send the light, dispel the darkness, come and rescue me. I still need to be rescued today. That is who he is. And he shows up every time we pray that prayer. Jesus stood up in, in front of those candles, those ginormous candles, and he said, I am the light of the world. And he was saying, just as the earth was empty and void and darkness was there, so was your life. But I have come. I have come. And we will always be empty, and darkness will rule without Jesus. <clears throat> and I know you and I know that, because how many of us have chased after wealth? How many of us have tried to find peace and harmony and fulfillment in everything except Jesus? In our addictions to alcohol and cigarettes and pornography and drugs and whatever else it is that Satan tries to shackle us to how many of us try to find something to fill up our emptiness when we are finding love in all the wrong places and we're doing all of these ridiculous things instead of turning our eyes toward the source of light. There is no darkness in him. John chapter 3, we like... Um, for God so loved the world, that part. But this is what comes after that. Um, light has come into the world, but the people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light, for they fear that their deeds will be exposed. Is that not true? How many of us have secret sins that we think God has never known about? How many of us think that we can hide them so far down in our heart that there's no way that he will ever find out about them? Guess what? God's truth says, but whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done 
has been done in the sight of God. God sees everything. You cannot hide from him. The bottom pit of your heart where you have locked away that sin can never be dark enough for his light not to penetrate it. And he is here today reminding us of that on a day when we are uh, remembering the feast of remembering. He wants us to remember that Jesus is the light of the world so that he can come and he can expose those things in our lives that separate us from him, not because of us, but so he could be glorified when we are rescued from it. So at least let's be honest with God and with each other this morning. And let's just peel away those masks. I know that there are people in this room. I'm probably one of them. I know I'm one of them. Where it feels like there's more earth in my life than heaven. And if you feel like there's more earth in your life than heaven in your life, then we need to cry out to Jesus. We need to ask him to come and shine his light upon us and just rip out those things that separate us from him. I want you to close your eyes because I feel like we need to pray this prayer. Jesus. If you already know everything about us, if what John wrote and what your your son said is really true, then you already know everything about us. And if nothing is truly hidden from you, if everything has already been exposed to you, then will you please give us the courage, give us the strength, give us the faith and the ability to just hand it over to you. Will you take the keys out of our hands? Will you go into the empty chambers and the dark chambers of our hearts? Will will you open up those doors? And will you (laughs) just free us from those things? When those keys are in Satan's hands, will you snatch them out of them? out of his hand, and will you come with those keys, and will you unshackle us from everything that has us in bondage to the darkness? Jesus, we need you to be light for us. You tell us in that same psalm to cry out, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. We cry out that to you. Jesus, come and expose the things in our hearts that you need to come and heal with your light. Because nothing can fill us except your light. You were in the beginning, Jesus, with God. There's never been a time when you didn't exist, which means there's never been a time when your powerful light hasn't existed. You, in you, is life. And in the life that is in you, you are the light of men. You are the light of the world. Your light shines in the darkness of our lives, and you promise us That when you shine your light upon the darkness that is oppressing us and constricting us and wearing us down, you will make that darkness flee. And this morning, in your place, when we've got, when we are in the Holy of Holies that you have invited us into, God, we need you to shine the Shekinah glory of God upon us. We desperately cry out to you to come and to free us. Oh, Jesus. Fill us up with your light.
every part of our body that is wounded and hurting, every part of our spirit, every part of our mind that is wounded and hurting because of the evil and the darkness in this world, will you just come and let your light flow upon us from the top of our head down through our whole entire body and out the bottom of our feet, God, will you fill us with the light of the world? And then, Jesus, when you've had your way with us, will you prepare us and get us ready to go and do what you said in Matthew? You are the light of the world, and you said we are the light of the world. And so light us up, fill us up, shape us and form us with your light, and then send us to go and to take that light into the darkness of the world. But heal us first. Prepare us first and get us ready to go and be your light in this world. We love you, Jesus. As we come to your holy table this morning, will you pour your love out upon us? Will you pour out your forgiveness upon us? Will you pour out your light upon us? Will you help us remember your faithfulness? Will you help us remember all of the other times in our lives where we were desperate for you to come and expose the darkness? And when you did it, it fled. And so give us a a heart of remembrance. Give us a mind of remembrance that we can see your fingerprints upon us so we can say, ah, That was the time you did that, and that was the time that you did that. And today, will you let this be a time when you yourself are glorified? Because we say that today, in this sanctuary, you came and you lit us up, and you dispelled the darkness, and you healed us. And it is in your powerful name we pray this. Amen.